here, so we'll uh, get started in just a second. All right, so uh, welcome everybody. I am Jamie Cope with the WVU Industrial Extension, and I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's podcast, uh, OSHA's Top Violations and How to Avoid Them. We've got uh, John Frazier, who's going to be doing that presentation. And we've also got uh, the, the second part of our uh, health and safety team, Greg Green, on the call as well. So we're uh, really fortunate to have two guys who really know, uh, know their stuff, and they're going to share some information. Uh, just a real quick background, in case you're not familiar with the WVU Industrial Extension, uh, we're uh, the... the State of West Virginia's MEP or Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Every state has at least one, and we're the one for West Virginia. And uh, the real, real short of it is our goal is to help manufacturers uh, do things better. So uh, whether it's certifications, health and safety, uh, continuous improvement, we're there to help uh, or and, and in any other way we can. So never uh, hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions with uh, about manufacturing. And we are... Again, happy to help in any way we can. And if we don't know the answer, we will find someone who can help. But uh, you guys didn't come here to listen to me talk. Uh, we're going to let somebody a lot smarter than me take over. So, so John, take it away and tell us all about stuff. Oh, oh, but before I do that, I got to say, uh, we keep things really informal here. So um, if you've got a question, uh, it really helps if you save it till the end. Um, and then there'll be a plenty of opportunity for questions. If, but if you want to put them in the chat along the way, that would be great too. So uh, we'll try to get to those as uh, as they come up. And I think that's it now. Did I fit? Did I forget anything, John? I think you got it. Maybe we'll get started. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Why everyone eats lunch. Um, so yeah, hello. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our free webinars at noon. Um, before we get started any, any further, I wanted to remind you about some of the other upcoming uh, webinars that we have scheduled. You can see on the slide here. And you can find a complete list of webinars and workshops uh, in our event sections of our website. And all of our workshops start at noon, uh, like this one, unless otherwise noted. Um, so definitely catch those. Uh, my name is John Frazier, as Jamie mentioned, and I'm the manager of industrial hygiene and occupational safety and health at WVU Industrial Extension. Um, I've been with the Industrial Extension for 24 years. And during my time, I've helped manufacturers identify hazards. I've educated workers. Um, I've provided expertise to eliminate or reduce occupational exposures in the workplace. Um, I, I live in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, and it's in Hampshire County, if some of you've been over in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, more specifically, I'm in Springfield. Uh, West Virginia, which is a small town, uh, just under 500 people, but has lots of outdoor recreation. You can see my kayak here. I was on a lake in Springfield, so pretty cool. Uh, I am a board certified safety professional. Um, I hold both a master's degree in industrial hygiene, um, as well as a doctoral degree in occupational safety and health. Um, so I've spent uh, most of my time uh, in health and safety. Uh, so uh, the great news is, as Jamie mentioned, uh, my colleague, Greg Green, who's part of the safety and health team here at uh, Industrial Extension, is also an excellent resource for our clients. And Greg is in the Northern Panhandle and has extensive knowledge in safety and health and um, with over 17 years experience. And when I was putting this together, I realized that Greg and I combined <laughs> have 41 years of uh, safety and health experience um, so, and we don't claim to know everything, of course. Um, so, you know, if there are any questions that we can't answer that you come up with, which I'm sure there will be some, uh, we will do our best uh, to research it and respond back uh, directly to you with an answer. Uh, so finally, we both work statewide, even though I'm in the Eastern Panhandle and Greg's in the Northern, uh, we work uh, statewide. So it doesn't matter where you're located, uh, WVU Industrial Extension can definitely help. Um, just a little bit more of a promoting the industrial extension, and trust me, this will be the only infomercial that we have. Um, but our team partners with small and medium-sized manufacturers in our state and help them support the operational improvement and business growth. And as part of WVU, the industrial extension uh, serves as the university's land-grant mission. 
and it's housed in the College of Engineering and Mineral Resources in Morgantown. So as West Virginia is affiliated to the NIST MEP National Network that Jamie mentioned, um, we are part of that nationwide program. So we can support the manufacturing community, uh, whether it's on a national, a state, or a local level. And our team focuses on developing consulting services that reflect our clients' needs. Uh, whether it's providing hands-on education or working one-on-one -on -one with our clients to deliver practical solutions, uh, we're going to deliver these on the slide here, workforce, uh, occupational safety and health, management systems, operational improvement, advanced manufacturing, uh, leadership development, and innovation and uh, growth services. So uh, let's move on to why we are here today. And that is presenting OSHA's top violations and how to avoid them. You know, in the next 30 minutes, we are going to review the latest citation data for general industry and discuss methods on how to control uh, those safety and health violations. And um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out, before we get started, I wanted to ask a question. We'll see how this works. Um, but I wanna ask what's in it for you. You know, why do we work hard to follow safety and health regulations? You know, why do we task our workers to wear personal protective equipment or to use ventilation? Or why do we ask our workers to operate properly guarded machines and follow procedures that keep them safe while performing maintenance on those machines? You know, so if anybody, I know we have, I don't know how many we have on here, 40 some people now. Um, if anybody like to unmute, maybe one or two of you even, and just provide a brief response to the question, what's in it for you as far as all the time invested in safety and health? Anybody interested in unmuting? I know a lot of people don't like speaking on, on these webinars. But if not, you can also put that in the chat if it's something you want to put in there. But I'll answer the question for me. It's really about you know, my family, my friends, my pets. It's all about life, right? So it turns out there's a lot in it for all of us. And we all know that lurking in our workplaces are unsafe conditions or hazards and unsafe acts or behaviors. And both these unsafe hazards and behaviors, they may lead to injuries and illnesses. Here's a good example of an unsafe condition. And we have two cylinders of gas. Um, they're, they're capped, but I'm not sure they're really secured. But there's a bigger problem here why it's an unsafe condition. And it's because the acetylene and oxygen cylinders are being stored together. And so the fix for this is to separate those cylinders when you're storing them, 20 feet, right? Or you could build a five foot high, half hour fire rated wall between them. So there's a couple options in that one for unsafe condition. Here's an unsafe act. And although this picture is sort of funny, uh, we all know that humans oftentimes do unsafe behaviors. And so whether you're operating a forklift without a fastened seatbelt, or you're grinding metal without ANSI Z87 rated safety glasses, you know, these unsafe behaviors really need to be our focus. And I'm guessing that most of you on this call have seen the pyramid of death, that where for every major incident, which would be a fatality, uh, there are 10 minor incidents and 30 property damages and thousands of unsafe behaviors. And this ratio comes from looking at a lot of incident data. And so you have workers who don't wear seatbelts while driving company vehicles, or your work trucks keep coming back at the end of the day with the taillights busted out, or workers keep cutting their fingers while handling metal. You know, all these incidents may eventually add up to that one fatality. And so this triangle of death is based upon the need to eliminate the non-injury incidents in order to eliminate the minor and serious injuries, meaning the death. And by focusing on preventing the thousands of unsafe behaviors or close calls at the bottom of the pyramid, we could reach the goal of injury elimination. The problem is, if you don't, is we don't know uh, when the unlucky event will occur. And that brings us to the next thought. You know, we can intervene by controlling the hazard. And we can control the hazard by implementing one or more of these hierarchy of controls shown in, in this slide. And um, whether it's elimination, physically removing the hazard or substitution, replacing the hazard, 
or isolating people from the hazard by using engineering controls or changing the way we work by using administrative controls. That'd be like a lockout tagout procedure. Or PPE, protecting the worker by making them wear something, right? And we wanna remember that personal protective equipment is the last line of defense against a hazard. It's the least effective control out of all of them. We also have to be able to anticipate and recognize hazards before we can even start to control them. And this is where OSHA's top 10 most frequently cited violations come into play. It provides us a place to start with our compliance efforts. So year after year, OSHA releases its most frequently cited violations. And although the rankings change, the topics remain consistent. So how do we avoid OSHA violations? And more importantly, how do we keep our workers safe and healthy? We don't wanna become part of the statistics, right? So first, uh, we need to comply with OSHA regulations. There's a whole big book, right, 1910 for general industry. And we need to prepare for OSHA inspections. So the, we have OSHA compliance, safety, and health officers, and they're there to protect workers and keep those workers safe from hazards. So in other words, make sure workers are safe and healthy and that the company is following the safety and health regulations. So are you ready for an OSHA inspector to knock at your facility's door? And more importantly, are you uh, keeping your workforce safe and healthy? Well, today's webinar is going to review the top 10 most frequently cited uh, violations and discuss ways to get control. So this is the latest data available for general industry. And however, I do wanna mention at this point that you can actually dial in the data by creating a customized top 10 for your North American uh, in, in industry classification system, the NA. ICS. And I want to just briefly show you how that works. So if we go to this, this website and the banner in the bottom, uh, it'll bring you to a page that looks like this. And you can actually enter, and I'm just going to put one in here. Um, you can enter your NAICS number and hit submit. And when you do that, it's going to generate a big list. And I just took the top 10 here. Um, but this is for, uh, for other chemical product and preparation manufacturing. So you can see the top 10 most frequently cited violations will be a little bit different from what we're gonna look at today. However, lockout, tagout, hazard communication, respiratory uh, protection, forklift, and PPE, machine guarding, they're all in the mix that we're gonna to discuss today. But when you dial it in, you also have confined spaces, welding, electrical, and fall protection violations. You know, think process and storage tanks and working at height heights when you're in the chemical industry like that. Anyway, I did want to share that site with you. It's at OSHA.gov, uh, as it's always better to tune in your exact industry. But I want to get back to the top 10 uh, data for general industry. And this is across all general industry uh, over the whole United States. So a few slides back, we were talking about an OSHA inspector knocking at your door and how to get control of the hazards in the workplace. However, before we can get control of anything, we need to consider the data. And here's the top 10 uh, most frequently cited serious violations for general industry. Again, four wall manufacturing as opposed to construction. Um, and this is the latest fiscal year 2021. So let's look at it. As you can see, the data shows that the chemical hazard communication and respirators, they take up six spots of the top 10. Taking up three more spots of the top 10 is machine guarding and lockout tagout, both important uh, standards. So that leaves just one spot and it's filled by forklift trucks, otherwise known as powered industrial trucks. That's the top 10. To look at them a different way, uh, in this chart, you can see uh, how they fall out. But the fact of the matter is, whether you're building a safety and health program from scratch or you're validating a well-seasoned uh, safety and health program, considering the top 10 most frequently cited uh, vi serious violations is an excellent place to start. So let's dig deeper into the data. Each of the top 10 violations that I just showed you can be further broken down by reviewing the top violations for the subpart that the violation falls under. For example, subpart N is in materials, handling, and storage. And that includes, that subpart includes the power industrial truck standard, which was number nine on the top 10 for 
uh, OSHA's uh, most serious violations. And so if we look at the top five for the most frequently cited violations for subpart N, we see it's all about fork forklifts, right? So let's take a closer look at how we can take control of our forklift hazards. First on the list is the competency training. Well, the employer uh, shall ensure that each powered industrial truck operator is competent to operate the powered industrial truck safely, as demonstrated by successful completion of the training and evaluation specified in this paragraph L. Keep in mind that paragraph L is the section on operator training that was expanded uh, back in December of 1999. So we have to provide forklift training in a classroom and then we have to evaluate each forklift operator why they demonstrate their skills on a forklift. Everything from the pre-inspection to the operation. So you should have an attendance sheet, a competency quiz, and handout uh, or a hands-on evaluation sheet that you uh, document at the forklift training. So if a worker passes the classroom and the hands-on and all the training requirements, then they become what we call an authorized forklift operator. So number two on the list is all about the certification. We hear certified op forklift operators all the time, that, that term. And while there, while there isn't really any forklift certification other than the employer certifying that each operator had been trained and evaluated, that's it. Anyone who's competent and knowledgeable about forklifts in the power industrial truck standard, the 178 standard, can provide the classroom training and the hands-on evaluation. Again, there's no nationally recognized forklift trainer certification. Remember, it is the employer providing the certification, right? And the certification shall include the name of the operator, the date of the training, the date of the evaluation, and the identity of the person performing the training or evaluation. That can become your forklift certification card that you could give out to your workers. But again, it's the employer certifying. Number three is all about the refresher training, including an evaluation of the effectiveness of that training. So refresher training, they say, shall be conducted to ensure that the operator has knowledge and skills needed to operate the forklift safely. And we have to do refresher training whenever the operator has been observed to operate the truck in an unsafe manner, has been in a, involved in an accident or a near miss situation, has received an evaluation that reveals the operator is not operating the truck safely, has been assigned to drive a different type of truck or the workplace condition changes. Otherwise, as most of you know, the evaluation is gonna be initially and then every three years. But you may have to do refresher training from time to time, depending on those different circumstances. The number four spot uh, is all about completing the forklift training. Right? So prior to permitting any employee to operate a fork truck, except for training purposes, the employer shall ensure that each operator has successfully completed the training. So again, it's the employer who has to make sure they're having these workers complete the training. So in other words, all workers who operate forklifts must be authorized by the company prior to operating. The only way to be authorized is to pass the classroom in the hands-on training. And I think it's also important to remember that the forklift training must be forklift and workplace uh, specific. So you're probably gonna most likely do it on site. Finally, the last one is forklifts shall be examined before being placed in service and not placed in service if they show any condition that could adversely affect the safety of the vehicle. So what does that mean? Well, it means that forklifts need to be examined or inspected at least daily or where used on a round the clock basis, like multiple shifts, they have to be examined after each shift. So defects, you know, when they're found have to be reported immediately and corrected. So basically, you need to create a forklift visual inspection checklist and train your operators to conduct that inspection either daily or at the beginning of each shift, depending on your situation. A lot of, folk, uh, a lot of people will ask, you know, does this inspection need to be documented? Well, no, but if it's not documented, it may not be done. So the proof is really in the documentation. I definitely would um, encourage you to document it. So with forklifts out of the way and subpart N, we need to consider subpart J, 
which includes standards like the permit confined space standard and the control of hazardous energy, the lockout tagout standard. As you can see, the top five spots in subpart J have to do with the control of hazardous energy, lockout tagout, which was number seven on our top 10 list. So let's break it down. OSHA's lockout tagout standard requires that employers to adopt and implement practices and procedures to shut down equipment. They have to isolate it from its energy sources and prevent the release of potentially hazardous energy while a worker is performing maintenance or servicing the equipment. So the procedure is going to use locks and hardware. It's going to use tags to control the hazardous energy while an authorized employee performs the maintenance. So it's all about getting the equipment to zero energy. And while to do that, companies have to develop equipment-specific written lockout tagout procedures. So that's the first one. Number two is, moving on you know, to of subpart J, uh, the employer shall conduct periodic inspection of the energy control procedure. So let me ask you a question before we go any further. How often, often, is the periodic inspection conducted? Jimmy, I don't know if we have that on a poll or I, I don't think we do. We can. Uh... Oh, okay, no problem. So if you want to place that in the chat box, that's fine too. Um, I'm, you know, I'm seeing some, let's see if I, yep. So Chris Warnick says B, annually. Um, and that would be correct. Uh, so we need to do this periodic inspection annually. And the inspection must also be performed by an authorized employee other than the one using the lockout tagout procedure being ins inspected. What's the purpose of that? It's to correct any deficiencies with the lockout tagout procedure. Over my years, I've seen a lot of these uh, have backfed control panels and different things like that. So that would catch those kind of things. So the periodic inspection has to be done annually, and that's OSHA speak for annually, right? And to make sure that that procedure is still valid, has to be documented. Um, the employer must confirm that the periodic inspection has been performed by identifying and documenting at a minimal, the machine or equipment, the date of the inspection, the employees included in the inspection and the inspector. So there's some documentation on those periodic inspections. The next one's easy. Just like a lot of safety standards, you must develop a written lockout tagout safety program that outlines how your company is going to deal with the 147 standard, the control of hazardous energy. And this includes the often um, missing equipment specific lockout tagout procedures. As you know, there are three types of people in the lockout tagout program they're affected, authorized, and other employees. And everybody's going to fit into one of these roles. So authorized employee is one that uh, services equipment and, and is authorized to apply lockout tagout. The affected employee operates or uses equipment being serviced under lockout tagout. And the other employee is someone who works in an area where lockout tagout is being used. I had another question here. If you want to put this into the chat, that would be fine too. But which type of employee would have an actual lock? and works on the equipment. And I'm guessing most of you will know this one as well. And so, yes, it would be an authorized employee. That, that's good. And um, so the authorized employee is the one that's gonna be doing the locking and tagging. And it's because their life is on the line, right? While they're performing maintenance and servicing equipment. So moving on to the final violation in subpart J, Procedures shall cover the following elements, right? It's all about the application of control. So that you have to have these established procedures that are going to, for the application of uh, energy control procedures. And they have to follow these, right? You have to ID the energy sources. So we have to give the magnitude of energy, notify others, shut down, isolate, apply the lockout tagout equipment, whether it's locks and tags or hardware, uh, we have to release the stored energy, verification, step seven's big, um, and then you're going to perform the service and then you're going to release it. So we got to make sure that our procedures follow all of this. Okay, so we just discussed lockout tagout, but what about machinery and machine guarding? This is subpart O, right? So you can look at the top five here and we're going to go through each of these and talk about what they mean. 
Uh, machine guarding is a violation that showed up twice in the, in the original top 10, and it's all in subpart O. So first, the number one on the list is uh, one or more methods of machine guarding shall be provided to protect the operator. That's pretty clear, and it gets cited a lot. From hazards such as those created by the point of operation, ingoing nip points, rotating parts, flying chips, sparks, it all has to be guarded. So anywhere you can put your hand, if it's not guarded, it could fall under this 212 standard. The next one, you know, all machines, can, well, I should mention this before we go on, I just put this in, but all machines uh, consist of three fundamental areas. It's the point of operation, that's where the work's being done, the power transmission device, and the operating controls. Machine safeguarding helps protect workers from preventing injuries, uh, preventable injuries in all these three areas. So number two has to do with what needs to be guarded. Well, all hazardous um, mechanical motions and actions need to be guarded. We just mentioned that. In fact, identifying hazards is the first step towards protecting workers and promoting safety in the workplace. So the basic types of hazardous mechanical motions and actions would be in running nip points and cutting and punching and shearing, bending, rotating, reciprocating, all of those. Even though the, the, the number two had to do with the point of operation, it also has to do with all the other things that need to be guarded. But more than likely, they're gonna point out the point of operation where your hands, or where the, uh, the drill bit meets the wood. It's where the work's being done. So everyone has an abrasive pedestal grinder, probably at their facility. You know, number three on the list has to do with the abrasive wheel machinery. And there's multiple violation points that have to do with this abrasive wheel and, and a pedestal grinder. But the one here that gets uh, cited and shows up uh, in this subpart is that you must maintain a quarter inch or less between the tongue guard and the abrasive wheel. And you can see that in this picture. As that wheel wears down, you're gonna to have to make that adjustment. Remember removing the chain guard on your bicycle as a kid. Well, number four on the list has to do with guarding power transmission points. In fact, we must guard all power transmission points. And that would go for chain and sprocket like this picture, as well as belt and pulley, rack and pinion, any of those. And to carry on from the previous conversation on abrasive wheels, the number five most frequently cited in subpart O states that there must be an eighth inch or less gap between the tool rest and the abrasive wheel. And again, this picture pretty much shows that um, you need to make that adjustment as the wheel wears down. That reminds me uh, to talk about sounding the wheel. In the chat box, anybody wanna uh, say, or say yes or no, whether they've heard uh, anything about sounding the wheel? This comes right out of the OSHA standard. And, um, and so, yes, some people have, have heard that, and that's good. Um, let me talk about it real quick. It's really important. Uh, you have a, a new stone that you're going to mount on that abrasive wheel. You have to do that ring test prior to mounting the wheel to the, to the grinding machine. So how do you do that? You can suspend the wheel, and you can tap gently with a light non-metallic implement, like a handle of a screwdriver for light wheels and maybe a wooden mallet for heavier industrial wheels. And the key here is you're going to tap it on all four 45s. You're going to turn it and tap it again. You try to work your way around the whole, the whole wheel. And it will sound like a ring, like on a bell, right? And if it thumps, then the wheel has a crack in it, uh, which isn't good if you're to use it. So it's called the ring test, and you might want to look that one up. So let's move on. Personal protective equipment. This is the last line of defense found in subpart I, right? As you can see, four of the five in subpart I have to do with respirators. So I wanna dig in a little bit further on this. First, you have to be medically cleared prior to wearing a respirator or being fit tested. So this consists of having a worker answer questions in an exam with maybe follow up with a healthcare professional. Um, depending on what the healthcare professional wants to do, that could trigger uh, you know, more testing. But in the end, you're gonna be medically qualified, yes or no. And that's the first step of any respirator program. So the best way to handle that is to get your worker medically cleared by sending them to a healthcare provider. Once they're clear, we can do fit testing and we can follow up with respiratory uh, protection training and those kind of things. But that number one gets cited the most. Number two on the list is all about fit testing, which is at least an annual requirement. 
initially and then annually. And this picture shows what was discovered during a recent fit test that I was doing, where a worker couldn't achieve a passing fit. And we found out why when we started to dig into the respirator and take it apart. Um, so this goes to show you that keeping respirators clean is a really important part of that program. Number three talks about establishing a written program. And again, the, the program is going to outline the respirator guidelines. If you need help with developing a program and any of this stuff, please reach out. Number four talks about the PPE hazard assessment. So it's getting out of respirators, but we have to do this, right? So basically, you have to go around and assess the workplace, each task, each job function, to determine if hazards are present or likely to be present, which would necessitate the use of personal protective equipment. And if they are present or likely to be present, then the employer has to select and have each affected employee use the types of PPE that's provided. They have to communicate their selection. Um, they have to select the PPE that's going to fit the workers and so on. But that PPE assessment is really important to do. And that has to be in writing. Finally, the last one in subpart I is the employer shall ensure that each employee can demonstrate knowledge of at least the following regarding respirators. So in other words, I've just completed my annual respiratory training. Can I answer all these questions? You know, why the respirator is necessary and how improper fit usage and maintenance can compromise that fit. You know, what are the limitations and capabilities? Um, how to use the respirator effectively in emergency situations, how to inspect it, how to put it on, how to remove it, do a positive negative check. You know, what procedures are for maintenance and storage. And then recognize how to recognize medical signs and symptoms that may limit or prevent the effectiveness um, of the respirator. And that would be like a seizure or an asthma, broken rib, maybe even anxiety. Um, and the general requirements of this section. See, your, your workers should be able to answer all those questions after doing the training. So along with respirators, here's the big one that shows up every year. Chemical hazard communication, which takes up, just like respirators, takes up three spots in the top 10 most serious uh, violations for general industry. This means that if you have an OSHA inspection, you have a really good chance of receiving an OSHA citation involving the right to know. I mean, the right to understand standard, right, has come. So one other thing to note here is that subpart Z includes other standards like occupational exposure limits, all the air contaminants, the major chemical standards like cadmium and hexavalent chromium and formaldehyde and lead, as well as the bloodborne pathogen and access to medical record standards. However, all the top five in subpart Z have to do with hazard communication. Let's break it down. First, you have to have a written program that outlines how your company is going to handle the HASCOM standard. And that would be from labeling to safety data sheets to employee training. If you don't have a written HASCOM program, we would be happy to help with that. Secondly, if you haven't already, you need to train your workforce on hazard communication and document the training. Again, you need to provide workers with effective information and training on hazardous chemicals in their work area at their initial assignment, or whenever you have a new chemical or a new hazard that would be introduced in that area. You have to do information and training. You can cover it in categories like flammability, or you can cover the specific chemical itself. Chemical-specific information must always be available through labels and safety data sheets. And again, if you need assistance with HASCOM training, we would be happy to help with that. Safety data sheets, you know, these are your chemical blueprints that were really improved with the updated HASCOM program back in like 2012, when they did the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. When that was put into action, it really made it a lot better. So thirdly, you have to have an inventory list at the front of your SDS binder, and then a safety data sheet for each chemical in the workplace. The safety data sheets need to be available to workers at all times. And more importantly, you have to make sure your workers understand how to find and read the safety data sheet. And that can be accomplished during training by having your workers answer important questions about the chemical using the safety data sheet. Like how much can I be exposed to or what color is it or how does it smell? Um, and you don't want to document that. So 
For a real quick um, detail on labeling, let me back up here, yeah. Um, I wanna talk about this real quick, but you have to first have a GHS label on all primary containers. And it's the responsibility of the importer, the distributor, the manufacturer. And if you look at this, this slide here, you can see there's six things. We have to have the product identifier, what it is, the supplier identification. We have to have precautionary statements, hazard statements, signal word. In this case, it's danger, but you could also have warning. There's just two sign uh, signal words. And then we have um, hazard pictograms, and there's nine of them, or you might not have any. Um, but this is all on primary containers. And um, here's a great example of a primary GHS label. You know, notice the pictograms again. We just mentioned that. And um, you got to train your workforce on the nine pictograms. Here's an example of a secondary container label that has a lot of GHS label on it. Notice the NFPA label that's built around the pictograms. That would be the blue, yellow, red, and white. And again, you need to train your workers on how to label a secondary container. You wanna be uh, certain to con consider all chemicals in your HASCOM program, whether they're solids, whether they're liquids or gases. And this includes welding rods, oxygen and propane tanks, or it could just be piles of sand that your workers are using. And finally, remember that the dose makes the poison. This is the basic principle of toxicology and how all the regulatory occupational exposure limits are set. Paracelsus uh, in 1538 stated that all things are poison and nothing is without poison. The dosage alone makes it so that a thing is not a poison. So it's all about that dose, right? Um, to break it down, you need to consider all chemicals, solid, liquid, and gases. You gotta keep the labels on your incoming materials. This is your primary containers. You got to label all secondary containers, whether they're jars or spray bottles or whatever it is that you're going to be filling from a primary container. You got to make sure your workers know where to access the safety data sheets and how to read them. And also remember that the dose makes the poison. Now, if you can smell, see it, taste it, <laughs> uh, you're, probably be, you're probably being exposed at some level. And therefore, you want to quantify that exposure. You know, again, we can help with a sample strategy. We can collect air samples to quantify worker exposure. And really, you, you should be putting science behind what you may already know, but it's the only way. Uh, otherwise, we would not know uh, the exposure without actually doing some air sampling. So with that, that's the top 10, OSHA's top 10 site of violations. A little bit of tips on how to control them, what you should be doing within the company. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to take those now. And if not, uh, I do appreciate your time and uh, look forward to uh, maybe working with you in the future. Yeah, John, that, that was great stuff. And uh, I did get um, a couple of questions in the chat. And, uh, you know, we don't want to stand between people and, and their lunch or anything. So yeah. please feel free to, to hang out around as long as you want. But uh, one thing that, that you did mention during your presentation that, that um, piqued my interest was the the PPE, and I know you got some new toys the other day. I'm almost surprised that they didn't show up in here. If you want to talk about what you got and how that will uh, coordinate to keep uh, people protected, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, and Jamie, I think you're you're probably talking about like hearing protection. Yes, and and we need to determine whether our our workers need to be wearing hearing protection or be part of a hearing conservation program. And so we just got some brand new equipment in um, the other day, and, and we had some dosimeters forever, um, but we got some new ones that have a lot better improved technology on them. Um, without the wire harness, they clip onto your lapel. Uh, they're really cool. And I was, I've already done a project with them and real excited how it, how it turned out. So we have those, um, so we can do noise sampling. Uh, we can do octave band analysis. We can do sound contour maps of your facility if you have like continuous noise. Um, we can do training. We can do a whole bunch in the noise in the hearing conservation area. So really excited about those instruments. I yeah, assume that's yeah. what you're referring to, Jamie. <laughs> I, I, absolutely, so, yeah. It, it, it's obvious that you have a lot of passion for this stuff, and it was it was fun hearing you talk about that in our our team meeting. Uh, it's uh -huh. kind of like a a kid at Christmas, not the. 
not, not, and, and that's a good thing. I, I think it was yeah. great that you're, you're that excited about stuff like that, which is great. And it's going to be great stuff for our, uh, our, our folks that are taking advantage of our services as well. So um, Chris uh, Warnick wanted to know, uh, was respiratory protection present with more emphasis in the 2021 OSHA top 10 due to COVID-19? You know, that's a good, good question, um, Chris. And, you know, every year I look at that data, I'm trying to think back pre-COVID. Um, but I think there was always some respirator in there, but it may have been more heavy this year. And Greg, you could speak up on this if you have looked at that data too, or anyone on the call for that matter. But I mean, to have three out of the top 10, it may have been, Chris. And I think it's definitely a big concern uh, whether, you know, how companies handle respirators and N95 masks, which are, which are also respirators um, in the workplace. So perhaps that, those numbers did go up because of that. I would really have to review that again. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't recall, but um, I know Hascom was always in there three to four times, but I think the respirators did jump in and uh, maybe it went up to three because of COVID. So we're all familiar with respirators now. <laughs> sure, sure. And uh, Susie uh, Huggins was asking if there would be a certificate for attending today. Um, I'm not 100% sure the answer on that. I'm sure we could, would, could put something together for you um, that would be unofficial. Um, you will get a, an email follow-up on this that's going to have a link to, to uh, the video recording and um, you know, uh, other links that were mentioned during the presentation. So if there is a certificate, we'll put it together in that. And uh, oh yeah, unofficial is fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can certainly put, Tracy will put something together for you that looks real good, I'm sure. Um, yes, we're, we're putting certificates together. So okay, those will be exactly. available. Thank you, Tracy. And um, one of the other questions uh, that came up was, uh, in order to drive a fork truck, do you have to have a valid driver's license? That's a good question. Um, you have to be 18. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know that it mentions in the standard anything about having a vehicle driver's license. Be a okay. good idea. Um, sure. But not everybody has a driver's license. So as long as they can pass the authorized training, which is the classroom and the hands-on uh, training where you have somebody who's knowledgeable and competent, uh, and your company passes them, yes, they, they would be authorized. So um, good idea to have a driver's license, but I don't believe, unless somebody else wants to correct me on that, I don't believe it shows up in the standard. And, you know, again, some people don't have driver's license. You get into the big city area, um, not everybody has a driver's license. So good question, though. And if that's something we need to really definitively clarify, you know, reach out to me by email and I'll get you. It, it get looks you like... Back uh, um, Tristano said, if you can drive, oh, wait, he said, uh, the standard does not require a driver's license to operate a, a PIT, so. Okay, so we got two, I see the agree. So yeah, good. I yeah. agree with you too, John. All right, Greg, yeah, it's good. Um, <laughs> Susie wants to know if you can drive a car at 16, why can't you have a fork truck at 16? Uh, so long yeah, as you have the training. Yep, that's a little, uh, I think even OSHA has a graphic on that showing no one under 18. Um, so yeah, that's a good good point though. Sure, sure. And Andy French, and I'll just point out one of my best friends from high school. Good to see you, Andy. Uh, uh, he says, can uh, SDSs uh, be available electronically only? Uh, is there a requirement to have hard copies available? They have to be available. And yeah, they could be, there's an OSHA interpretation letter. Uh, you can look it up. Um, but they allow the electronic storage of safety data sheets. Yes, the electric can go out. Um, there is some time to provide those sheets to your workers. So um, with that interpretation, yes. Um, a lot of these, um, we have some different SDS management systems we're using, and they actually have where they can store a hard copy uh, locally. So even if the internet went out, we could still provide it. With that said, is it good to also have a backup just in case? Sure. Having a paper copy somewhere that you could, you know, use in a in, in a certain you know time while the electric, you know, and the facility is down and you can't access them. 
you know, that would be fine. But no, I think electronic these days is, is the way to go. But that, if anybody else wants to comment on that, that'd be fine too. Greg, if you, know, if you have any other thing to add or anybody else. Um, but there, there's just definitely recognized electronic storage. Yeah, definitely. As long as they can get access to them 24 hours, then that's definitely acceptable. Yep. Good question. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So uh, any more questions before we uh, break break for lunch? And hopefully people were eating while they were watching too. But All right. That looks like it. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. And, and John uh, didn't put his uh, contact information up there for his benefit. He already knew it. So uh, feel free to reach out to him, and, and we'll make sure that his contact information and Greg's contact information is in the, the follow-up email as well. And uh, I, like I said, both of those guys are very passionate about what they do, so never hesitate to reach out to them with a question if you've got one. So um, I think that's about it for now. So everybody have a, a great time and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thanks again, John. Yep, thank you.